Uh, we'll get started. Uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, Albert Chang, uh, who's the EVP CPO at Digital Media, Disney, and, and ABC. Uh, he joined uh, that group uh, in 2005. And what's really interesting with, with what they've done uh, at Disney ABC is they were the first group to stream shows, uh, the first iPad app by a, a kind of a national network, so because Netflix was soon, and then uh, last year was the first to do live streaming. Uh, so certainly kind of pay, paving the way there. Um, to, to his left is uh, Neil Young. Uh, Neil spent time at uh, Electronic Arts, I was the founder of NG Moco that was acquired by DNA, uh, and is the founder of, of Network. And with that, uh, we've got a quick, quick video. And then to the left of Neil is uh, Sam uh, Rogaway. Sam is a, a multi-entrepreneur uh, for the last uh, couple of years. He was a founded TripUp, which is now owned by Kayak. Uh, also founded Near Networks and, and Touchflame. And uh, most recently is the, the founder and CEO of Victorious. We are all creators. And we've always wanted to get closer. Those who listen, those we watch, those we inspire, and those we aspire to be. Our screens have grown smaller, but our connections have grown stronger. We are all creators, but this time we move together. Great. So we're going to jump right into it. Um, at the end, we'll have time for a Q&A. But you know, if you do have a question actually during the session, feel free to raise your hand, because I'd really like to structure this more of a conversation versus just kind of iterating and, and shooting a, a bunch of questions uh, your way. So uh, the first kind of area I wanted to talk about was you know, what, what are you watching today, nowadays, um, viewing habits? I mean, all of you have kind of different constituents and different audiences. Uh, Neil, why don't you kind of start that, kick us off uh, on that topic? Well, um, you know, what was I watching uh, 10 years ago? I was watching TV. Um, I was going to the movies. Um, what was I watching five years ago? You know, I was starting to watch um, video online, you know. Um, what am I doing now? You know, now I'm watching uh, things where, where I can and when I can. And, you know, there are different contexts for me, you know, I'll watch something um, on my phone when that's my primary screen, I'll, you know, watch something uh, on my, in my living room when, you know, it's a live event or it's, uh, you know, something that is best served in the, on the big screen experience and, you know, and I'll watch things on my laptop, you know, so I think um, what's happened over the last 10 years is not so much a proliferation of screens but a proliferation of contexts. Um, that video and, and the things that, that spin around video, which actually I think is, is, is as important as the video itself. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's, for me, what's been sort of like the defining, the defining change. Uh, Sam, what, do, what are your thoughts on? So I, I think that uh, habits may be the wrong word now, because um, now you can binge on Netflix, you can snack on YouTube or your mobile device. Um, I think traditionally you would have to wait six, seven days until you watch another episode. Um, those habits, I think, have taken a major step back because now you can access content on so many distribution platforms and in so many different ways. So as I think about what I'm watching, uh, it's not so much habitual. It's more I get it anytime I want um, in different types of forms. And some of it's long form content, other is short form content. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm watching the season three of Video Game High School, which was created by Freddie Wong. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely watch it on YouTube. Um, an amazing series 
The last series was produced for $1.4 million. We produced six episodes of, of 30 minutes uh, each. Um, if you think about the Lost pilot, that was produced for around $10 million. So production costs have, have reduced, and I think quality has increased with respect to online. Um, and uh, people often thought of YouTube as cats on skateboards. I don't think they think of it that way anymore. anymore. So Albert, as a, as a content owner, I mean, how, how do you think about this, and especially in relation to your last comment with YouTube? Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's all good. I think for us it's good because there's more content. Um, the, the, as a content owner, I think what we've seen is that uh, the good thing is that there's more opportunities for more content to be produced and, and distributed. So the technology has given us the ability to expand reach in, in ways that were more constrained before. I think um, what's uh, challenging is that it's unpredictable. Where I would say in the past, content consumption was pre predictable. There's a time and place when you watch something uh, with certain people. And I even noticed that in my own uh, consumption habits, it was pretty predictable. I'd come home, I knew exactly what I was going to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. And now it's completely blown out of the, you know, blown pieces. Um, I watch things differently, different times, different screens. My wife and I used to watch it at the same time. Now we watch uh, things different times. Sometimes we watch at the same time, but different things. You know, so it's, it's, it's very unpredictable. I think that's the, 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 the new world that we live in right now. And uh, Sam, you mentioned in, in different types of formats that uh, you consume kind of based on different contexts. I think, you know, Albert, coming back to, to you just on, on that topic, as a content producer and distributor, I mean, how do you deal with these different types of content formats and, and lengths? Yeah, I, I think as a content producer in the traditional world, I think it's still a, a bigger struggle for us because we are sort of locked in these sort of traditional models of how you know we create content and how it gets monetized. So I think the the idea of moving to new formats is a little bit more of a struggle because at the end it's always about like what's the business model, you know, what's our incremental gain, is it big or not? Um, you know, I think it's been uh, different formats have actually impacted us more in the news area because you know no one you know consumption of news is not you know you don't sit. sit in front of your TV and watch the news at 6 o'clock or 6.30 anymore, and everything's been shortened, right? And now um, with, short, with entertainment content, um, you know, it, it's, we, we are, it is one of the hardest things to do because I think even internally, you know, the idea of create, telling a story shorter is not sort of win the wheelhouse of people who make television content. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, there's an interest, um, certainly in, in where we are at, at Disney ABC, but you can definitely see sort of the growing pains of like, well, how do we tell a story? I mean, Brian talked about telling a story. Um, we, we are struggling to figure out how to, how to tell it in, in that short period of time, which actually opens up you know, a lot of opportunity for because that's the medium they grew up on. Neil, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, just uh, listening to you talk that, you know, we think about the innovator's dilemma, you know, typically in the technology um, space, but, you know, it occurred to me then when you were talking that actually, um, there's sort of the innovator's dilemma in the storytelling space as well. And, um, it, you know, I think the challenge probably for, um, you know, great content makers and, uh, and media companies is to sort of figure out how to, um, you know, how to um, manage that transition from kind of one way of telling stories to a new uh, way of telling stories. And what are the new things that kind of get brought into the equation, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that, um, something that, that Brian Grazier was saying when he was talking about the relationship that you have with uh, television characters. Um, if you look at the r relationship that, um, you know, a YouTube creator has with um, their audience, that trust has moved kind of way beyond just trusting the persona of the character and into the actual creation of the content itself. And so, you know, as you move kind of closer towards as the, the audience um, and the content creators become closer, it creates a lot of new challenges in actually how you create that content. And so a question that I ask myself sometimes is, at what point does it fundamentally change the nature of creation? At what point is it actually no longer kind of continuous, but it's actually discontinuous? And you just have to go th do things differently. And I think at that point, it, becomes, it, it might become very challenging for, um, existing media companies to play well in that space. Doesn't mean they go away, mm -hmm. it just means it might be a new space. But I want to add that the storytelling that was driven by commerce, right? So if you think about long form television, um, producers and writers have to write in acts that go to a commercial break, right? So as, if you think about when a t uh, uh, an hour television show, <laughs> as more commercial breaks were created, 
you know, writers and writers were asked to write differently. You know, you have to make sure that you you have to get the audience through the commercial break and back in. Right. So a lot of the ways stories were told in TV are very much designed around you know, how we're going to monetize the content. So it'll be interesting interesting to see as you look at short form and how the internet starts to you know evolve. Like right now, the short form is very much designed around the the pre roll. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you get to seven minutes? What does that model look like? Is there a mid roll in that? I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how the commerce part of it starts to shape how you know internet native or digital native content but, but isn't the pre-roll itself kind of just a hangover of traditional media it's like yep. maybe that's just kind of broken and you know I think my, my personal view is the stuff that um, you know companies like Sam's you know are doing or you know um, to, to, a, to a different degree you know uh, ours um, where you're where you're really trying to kind of figure out um, completely new ways to you know monetize um, engagement, if you like. Yeah, and Sam, I was just thinking about our, our discussion here of the different kind of formats, different consumption in different contexts. What are you seeing when you look at these different kind of YouTube makers, if you will? Like, how do you see that kind of going in the future? Because I mean, we can look at the temporal side, the short and long, but there's also just the device itself with a screen, like the glass. And how does that factor into the different types of content that you're seeing? On your, your well, world? I think, Albert, you mentioned seven minutes and, and what's the challenge going to be on monetizing that content. Think about six seconds. Um, whereas traditional media is boxed into ad units and having to build content around that, now you have platforms such as Vine where advertisers need to invent a new ad unit to monetize that sort of content. So the, the form of the content is dictating the commerce that will continue to um, allow that ecosystem to prosper. I think when it comes to, to mobile, if you look at YouTube today, over half the audience comes from a mobile device. Um, we have to break out of this just broadcast consumption paradigm. And engagement needs to mean a lot more things. Um, Neil mentioned that there's a different social contract between creators, digitally born creators, um, such as those on YouTube, and their audience. And I think that that fan base can be monetized in ways beyond just advertising. For instance, uh, microtransactions and in-app purchases. Um, within the United States, you haven't seen anyone really marry that type of commerce with video content. Although if you look to China, for instance, YY has made uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in doing so. So uh, I think there's opportunities to unlock brand new re revenue streams that are very germane to the platform in which you're consuming that content. Um, another thing that I mean, as a, as a consumer uh, that I'm seeing, and I'm sure you are too, is that you know, much like the early days of the web, there's just there's coming a huge amount of content to consume, and there's this discovery problem. And I'm kind of curious to hear uh, in your, your reviews, and I'll start with you, Neil, just on how, to, how do you think that's going to be solved? Is this going to be through curation by some kind of layer, or, or how are we going to solve that problem? So that's sort of at the core of what you know, network is ultimately trying to, you know, to, um, to solve for. Um, you know, there are, in traditional, you know, television today, there's hundreds of channels and um, in, on the internet there are literally millions of channels of content that you can, uh, that you can sort of tune into and it's sort of uh, reached the point where it is Im you know, essentially impossible to find the content that is actually interesting to you. You know, we held a little um, forum in um, a space we have here in Los Angeles and we invited some you know, media um, people, people from the media industry and some interesting uh, people with interesting opinions. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the guys there said, ah, there is amazing, amazing content um, on YouTube. Amazing content on YouTube. Thank fuck no one can find it, you know? <laughs> and, sorry for the F-bomb. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's so much content being created right now that is actually relevant to you. Um, it's just going to get lost. And, you know, if, if you don't figure out kind of how to essentially, you know, solve that problem, um, you're, you know, I think consumers are going to end up sort of ultimately being um, under, you know, underserved. So, you know, in a, in a future where, you know, there are hundreds of channels on television right now, people basically gravitate towards sort of six to eight for them. You know, in the future that we see, you know, there will be, you know, a few sources of, um, of, co of content that um, customers trust to recommend, deliver their content to them. And instead of them necessarily having to go out and search for it or seek it, you know, it will come to them. Sam, what are your thoughts, especially as you're building 
you look, looking at YouTube, a lot of discovery happens uh, not programmatically, not through algorithms, but happens manually with one creator collaborating with another creator and the audience saying, oh, I like that person as well. And I'm going to check out their content. So you still see um, this manual mechanism in order to engender discovery. Um, I think that we live in this sharing economy increasingly and ways in which we can unlock the power of creators collaborating, curating contents on their own, um, working with one another in more programmatic ways will engender greater discovery. But it's definitely a challenge that I don't think anyone has cracked, not even YouTube. Yep. Something you said in the green room that uh, I thought was really interesting uh, when you were talking about Victorious is you were talking about sort of, well, you know, yes, there's the content creators, but then there's also sort of the fans and the super fans that are creating content. It doesn't seem super scalable that, um, you know, that sort of content creator A could collaborate with content creator to B, and that would then introduce people to lots of new stuff, you know, consistently. But it does seem really scalable if, you know, super fan A or fan, you know, A um, is connected to, you know, super fan B or fan B, and, you know, ideas can kind of move, you know, that way, or content can be discovered that way. That sort of social discovery from a starting point seems really interesting. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Maker Studios may disagree with your first point because yeah. uh, a lot of that audience was generated based off of collaboration between creators and young creators appearing in a more senior creator, more popular creator's video, and then amassing an, an audience. So um, it's, you know, unfortunately, it, it's not programmatic, but that's how that ecosystem has grown up. I think that the, there, we spend a lot of time thinking about fans and what does fandom mean, particularly today in, in a millennial generation, and fans are creators. And they're looking for better ways in which to express themselves. Um, and as that fan becomes a creator, you create more content. Um, but I think that rather than it being ubiquitous, you look at it in a very kind of niche community by community uh, segmentation so that fans feel like this is a place for them that's truly their own. How do you make your platform stand out, though, in that kind of crowded, crowded world? Of the fans? Well, from our perspective, we, uh, it's not our platform, it's the creator's platform. And I think that's what distinguishes at least our company from a lot of other traditional centralized gateways or portals. Um, creators are part of many platforms already. They're part of Facebook, they're part of Twitter, they're, they're on YouTube, and it's hard to migrate that audience from place to place. Uh, it, it's different if a creator says, come download me and be part of my world. And I think that that's where we distinguish ourselves from other platforms that are out there, that it truly is the creator's platform. We're just powering it. So in, in the last session, uh, Al briefly mentioned in the last week or so some of the unbundling that, that, that's going on uh, with, with CBS, uh, with HBO. Kind of curious to, to hear your thoughts, certainly, from, from a Disney ABC on, on that trend. Is that something should we expect from, from your company as well? And you know, if, if not, why? Um, so I think, I mean, Al talked about the two big ones, HBO and, and CBS. I, I'm, you know, I'm, it's sort of premature to say this is a, a, going to be a, an industry trend. I think um, each of them had their very specific business decisions and why they did it. And they're very different, I, I believe. Um, you know, for Disney, uh, we have our sort of direct-to-consumer play. It's Hulu. I partner with NBC and Fox and that. So I don't think we have the, the real um, reason why we would do a CBS-like play. Um, but there, but I will say in general, though, that I think in the long term, you're going to see a lot more experimentation of over-the-top sort of distribution models and and pricing models that um, that will definitely create more choice with with consumers. Um, I'm not sure it would be you know ABC at six dollars a month. And we actually did some tests, you know, I, I think a couple years ago, where we actually um, did some research, which unfortunately got leaked to one of the um, trade press. But it, we, we basically got feedback from a lot of our, our viewers that they were not even willing to pay $2, two ninety nine or whatever it was, um, per month. And part of it was just the fact that, and, and maybe different, right? CBS's product is you know, a library. There's a lot more content back there. And we were, we were looking at it more from a um, current, some library aspect, very little ads. Um, but the problem is that it's very difficult to get a consumer to feel that paying a subscription fee monthly and not have access to continue whole library, a lot of content, it's just, for them, ABC is just a channel, right? So the idea of a la carte is so difficult, I think, for any anybody in the industry to look at because we are better as a whole, and actually, in terms of the actual cable bundle, um, 
I would actually say that there's a there's a greater there's greater efficiency in the marketing that that comes with it as well as the the value of the package of the consumer. Once you start breaking it up into individual channels, I, I think it starts to you're going to start looking at those packages look like um, almost uneconomical for them. And, you know, do you two agree with that, or do you think we're going to see more in bundling? Um, <clears throat> I think I, I think we'll see more on bundling. Um, the sort of unbundling of the big channels is a little less interesting to me than um, channels that are really focused towards kind of targeted audiences, um, because those targeted audiences um, are not making purchasing decisions based on kind of like logic. You know, they're making purchasing decisions based on their affinity to, you know, a subject matter or a particular, you know, uh, category. You know, we sort of learned this in um, in games. The last company, Mike mentioned, was a, was a video game uh, company. And we spent, you know, a lot of time thinking about um, how essentially a very small percentage of our audience that um, would you know, would pay the vast majority of the, you know, of the, of the money um, that we generated. And, you know, we, we focused a lot on people moving beyond sort of this idea of need-based monetization, like I need to buy this thing in order to continue, to uh, want-based uh, monetization. I want to own this thing so that I can complete my collection and I can do well. And when people move from need-based monetization to want-based monetization, their sense of value changes really, really dramatically. So, you know, I think things like, you know, although small things like, you know, Acorn or Drama Fever, you know, sort of the things that are very targeted that can essentially generate very rich kind of revenue streams from a relatively small audience of people um, are particularly interesting, right? Because, you know, we're each this unique pastiche of the things that we're interested in. If you can kind of put together all those things that you are making um, purchasing decisions based on kind of emotion versus based on um, logic, you might be able to unlock in video the same type of kind of business gains that we saw in the game space, where we were essentially able to kind of like 10 times, you know, the kind of the per user revenue that could be, you know, that could be generated. So um, what, what I get really excited and interested, in, uh, interested about um, is when those, you know, tight verticals become you know, generally available or content from all over the place, you know, can be organized into tight verticals and sort of can change the, the, the nature of monetization around them. I actually think over the top presents opportunities for new bundles. Hmm. So, right, so it's sort of like, I mean, everyone's sort of looking at the big media guys to figure out, oh, what are we going to do for over the top? I actually think over the top provides opportunities like yeah. Drama Fever and a bunch of other types of very targeted um, opportunities for people to find an audience. That's a, it's a great lead in to the, the next topic. Why don't we bring up the, the slide, please? You know, each of these companies are becoming the, really the representatives of, of new media. And uh, you can see from the valuations and you know, the acquisition numbers, what's interesting stat is you know, last year, three and a half billion dollars went into investing in these types of companies. The year before was 2.2, so 60% increase. And so the logical question would be, you know, in this kind of new era, is it gonna be all these new players uh, or is it always going to be some combination of new and, and old? And I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously you're, you're pushing hard yeah. uh, to cross that, that chasm. Yeah, I, I mean, look, we, we as a company, we, we're playing in both spaces, right, with our acquisition or maker. But I think um, when you look at, at the bottom line comes down to, I, I think that the world will have um, a wealth of big old guys and new people in it. Um, the people who don't make it in the future are, the, are those who fail to look at um, the changes in their audience, the way their business has changed in terms of how they monetize it, and really, really focused on, at the end of the day, you know, who their customer is and whether they're meeting that quality. I think you know, any time any of these um, you know, sort of, you know, new entrants are coming uh, around is that you're seeing some really good um, content focused at a very specific audience that's not being served by big media. Look at Twitch, look at a lot, Awesomeness TV. I mean, I, I would say even Maker, all the content creators on Maker were basically feeding a need that was not being addressed certainly by anyone at Disney. We only cover kids 6 to 11 and 18 and above. We don't, we don't cover them in between. So who do you think is, is funding the, the future of entertainment? Is it you know, traditional old media? Is it YouTube? Is it VCs? I mean, what, what do you think? Well, at the end of the day, it's consumers. Right? They're going to they're going to decide 
you know, what content gets made at the end of the day, whether it's us or um, the maker guys. Um, but I think it's going to be, um, ah, I, I think it's a, it's a, this is a horrible answer. It's like all of the above. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> we just I mean, don't know. We just I mean, don't just know. Fine. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it depends on. Um, I, I think VCs will take a, a, a shot at creating some, you know, taking some risks that um, sometimes the big media guys won't. But you know. okay. and then as we kind of look in this future, curious to hear the, the, the panel's thoughts on where this future will be. Will Hollywood continue to be Hollywood? Will it shift to New York? or the Bay Area in this kind of new world? or What, what are your thoughts? Well, I just want to go back to, to the last question. I, I hope VCs continue to pump money uh, into the, the ecosystem. Uh, I think that it's driving innovation. Uh, a lot of the, the companies uh, up on the screen were more content-centric companies. They can only go as far as the platforms in which they distribute take them. A lot of those platforms are technology companies. So we, we, we enjoy seeing VCs continue to, to play in the space. Um, with respect to where content comes from, I, content has come from everywhere, but often creators have to come to Los Angeles or to New York or to other hubs to continue to practice their craft. Now that we've democratized distribution, creators can be anywhere and can build really big businesses without having to be here or in New York, and that's, that's exciting to see. I do think, though, one of the reasons that sort of Silicon Valley hasn't sort of propagated all around the world despite people, um, you know, uh, governments, um, municipalities investing money and trying to create environments for that to happen is you do have to have sort of a critical mass of, um, of uh, competency and um, expertise. You know, when you, um, when you sort of sit in the audience and you listen to Brian Grazer talk about kind of storytelling, you realize that he's thinking about it at just an insanely deeper level than you're thinking about it. And you know, um, if you spend time in, you know, in the Bay Area where I, you know, where I live, um, and you go to a coffee shop, you know, all around you is the conversation of creating a company and technology and technology being sort of at the core of that. And here, you know, storytelling is sort of at the center of, you know, is the center of the conversation. And so um, I don't really see any huge giant shifts. I think that there are great opportunities to kind of collaborate. Um, but I think, you know, Silicon Valley will remain um, a kind of a, a base of innovation for technology and platforms, and uh, Los Angeles will remain an, a, a base of innovation for, you know, storytelling and, uh, and content creation. I, I would agree with that. Um, going back to an earlier question in that uh, the, there's going to be a drive towards curation and the, the whole marketing piece of content, which is, I, I think it's going to come from everywhere. Um, more and more people, you'll have individual curators that will come from all parts of the world that are uh, essentially serving up and um, creating the connections of content to the, the intended audience. I mean, the idea that networks or cable networks are the primary gatekeepers of taste, I think are probably gonna be, are, are gonna be gone. And I think where Silicon Valley can come in is that you have a lot of curators and people of taste who are programming to certain people, but I think what technology will do in Silicon Valley is sort of how do you scale that, right? Because, I mean, that was, that was a question, right? How do you scale the, the content creators, it's hard, but if you have a platform that allows data to scale that taste to be, to sort of transport to more people, mm -hmm. I think that's how the whole ecosystem eventually works. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's gonna, they'll all play a role, right? But they'll all, pretty, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, Brian made a really uh, interesting comment about when he saw that video of uh, Eminem and just seeing his face and realizing, wow, like I could go build or you know, create a movie like, like 8 Mile. And we think, to the stars of tomorrow in this digital age, like how are those stars going to be born and how they're going to, I mean, clearly they might be identified based on YouTube, but like how, like the, it seems like that, they may be altered. Maybe it's actually the same. Maybe we still need these, these you know, incredible pickers, right, uh, Brian? But the sense to your earlier point that it's so democratized, I, the picking. Well, I, I think that we'll always need pickers like Brian. And, um, and you know, longer form content, there's so much value there, and, uh, and I don't think that's ever going to go away, and that, that's a great thing. But look at YouTube. Um, the, the stars that have been born off of that platform have been picked by the audience, um, and that's continuing to emerge. So you're, and, and not only with respect to eyeballs, but also financing content. So I mentioned Video Game High School. Um, most of that series was crowdfunded from Kickstarter, and um, this just, engenders more production, more creativity, people able to take more risks because they don't have to um, 
live by all the bells and whistles that traditional media may make them if they finance that content. I kind of switch to new technologies. VR came up a little bit in the, in the last session. Um, and you know, we're not only seeing advances in these distribution platforms, but we're seeing technologies that allow us to capture and create content our, ourselves. And this is last week, actually, an investment we made uh, was announced in Magic Leap. And let's just show the, the quick video. Having seen the actual demo and seen the product work, uh, that, that video doesn't entirely even do it justice. It's, uh, but if you imagine. Um, but I think it raises, you know, VR is really fascinating. I mean, there's you know, different companies like Jaunt and others that are potentially kind of creating brand new opportunities for directors, I think, in 360. Um, we're seeing content like when the drone flew the, through the fireworks up in Seattle. How do you, I'm just kind of curious to get everyone's thoughts on what are these new technologies? Is VR going to be a category just for games? Is it going to be really for these kind of next generation of shows? And or how does you know Disney ABC think about VR? Yeah, I think uh, at the it goes back to Brian's earlier comment about telling stories. I think the technology that looks pretty cool. Um, but the one thing I would say is like, well, okay, what's the story? I see an elephant in <laughs> it's this. It's an elephant in the hand. Like, the story. Are, are there guns coming out on this? Or I, I, you know, how did it, it make you feel? It, uh, it uh, weird. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> it worked. <Yeah. laughs> I, I, it gets back to story. I, I will say there's a huge, um, the really cool thing about VR, and um, I did see a prototype at Disney that our company's been working on, in 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 that space where um, you literally are looking at a storyline. Um, in a three-dimensional world where you can you know, rewind and take vantage points of the story happening in different places. Mm. Uh, that's a different, you know, you're sort of being set into a world that's happening, but you get to experience the story in different places at different points of time in the story. So I definitely think there's something there. It's just about like, how do you put yourself in that world and how do you experience the story? So I think there's a huge opportunity for, for VR, um, but it gets back to how to use the technology to tell a compelling, you know, emotional, story that, that, that evokes the emotion once you get into and put on those goggles. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a huge difference between um, watching and participating. Um, before NG Moco was at Electronic Arts and we made lots and lots of games and um, making um, a, what we would call a cutscene, you know, um, in a game is, you know, like making a small, you know, CG movie. Um, making a cutscene that you can move around in and interact in, and all of the actors perform the way that you expect they, you know, for them to perform, and you know the feet walk, walk on the terrain correctly. I mean, it's an incredibly complicated endeavor. You know, if you think about um, Grand Theft Auto um, and how long it takes a team of people who have basically built now five of those um, games to build something that, you know. Um, when you're sitting kind of like four or five feet away from it and you're controlling it, you can sort of, your imagination can fill in some of the gaps and let you believe that it's real. When you put on a headset and you're inside that world, everything that's an error will break you from the reality of the, you know, of the experience. So I think it, my, my experience says it's a really hard problem to build super compelling interactive um, stories. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to um, augment the information that is around us, which I think for me feels like the, the, the huge benefit of something like, you know, Magic Leap, um, and put me in sporting events, you know, like put me at the World Series, put me at the, you know, at the best seat in, you know, uh, at, uh, you know, at, at AT&T Park, you know, let me watch, you know, the Giants win and destroy <laughs> the Royals, um, but but I think there's a tremendous opportunity to be able to you know to um, you know to to put people in the center of live events, and that's a much less complicated problem with a much higher impact, I think, in terms of you know uh, the value to the to the end user. I think that works for some things, right? And for sports, I, for sports, um, and then I still think the hard part about VR is that, um, especially getting to the level that I think we would all feel that it's a worthwhile endeavor, um, it's still costly. So, I mean, unless, I mean, I'd love to hear about this, this company, but I think, you know, it's, how do you get, I think the costs are still pretty prohibitive to really think about how do you make this into a, a business? 
Well, it may be expensive now, but let's say if we, we, we project out, because it will get cheaper, right? And um, kind of, we'll say the generation past millennials 15 years from now, I mean, how do you imagine content being consumed? I mean, um, in, in, I mean, we're t sticking with the VR stuff or anything. anything. Yeah. I uh, I still think, and this is just maybe I'm being a traditionalist. I still think, um, by and large, that um, people take the lazy way out and like to be entertained. I mean, there's sort of there's a there's a there is something around being having a story told to you in a very passive um, way that uh, you're feeding an emotional need of having to escape from something either. You know, the realities at work, or the, the tough day. You know, tough day at the office. That um, you know, getting into and participating, unless it's something really cool that relaxes you. I, I, I'm not a gamer, so I, I can tell you that when I'm in a game, I don't relax. I actually, it's a heightened level of anxiety for me. So I'm not looking for um, a, that when I'm trying to relax. Uh, and more, and so I think I still think people. You know, we, we try so many different things in interactive television in the, in the last ten years that I've been doing this job, and for the most part, interactivity is still a very you know small percent of the audience, unless you're in you're doing sports, reality games, you know reality competition, game shows. But when it comes to scripted narrative, and you're watching Grey's Anatomy or Scandal. No one really, really wants to interact. I mean, something that because part lean of lean back and it's lean back. I, if it's a if it's a serial episodic when a story is being told. The no one wants to be taken away from someone speaking their lines. And we've tested that. You know, we've had synced content against second screen. It just like people fans found it interesting, but incredibly annoying, right? Especially when there's prompts about things coming at them. So I think there's still that there that there's that model of a passive entertainment experience. Um, I think it would be varied. It could be really short, or it could be a you know a long playlist of very short videos. But at the end of the day, it's still a passive experience. I think second screen's interesting because um, you, you heard so much hype, there was so much money that was invested. Every network had a second screen app, um, but most of them, if not all of them, failed because the second screen for people is Google and Facebook, uh, Snapchat. There's also this disconnect of toggling between what you're watching on your television and what you're doing in real time on your iPad or your phone. As we look at mobile, for millennials, that's the first screen. It's not that. And so I think that there are new opportunities that arise to create new formats that breed interactivity when everything is built into one screen and you don't have to toggle between screens. And that's something that we're working on right now. And what are your thoughts? 15 years from now, I can, um, I can imagine um, better, more personal delivery um, devices that maybe we don't hold in our hand, that maybe we you know, wear some other way. Um, can't really imagine convincing my wife in 15 years to let me have a big kind of multiple moving kind of like treadmill in my house so we can wear our headset and go walking around uh, somewhere, uh, some episode of, you know, Orange is the New Black, um, w which would actually be kind of cool actually now I said that. Um, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, but, uh, but actually, you know, what you were saying about, um, being entertained, um, I'm not sure it's lazy as much as it's kind of just enjoyable. You know, it's like we really appreciate a well-crafted story that moves us in a certain way. And we really appreciate sitting on the sofa with someone that we love or care about and sharing that experience together. So, you know, um, I don't see that going away. I could imagine the ways it gets delivered might, might change and adjust, but, um, that's my, my general thought. We're going to pause now and open it up to the questions uh, in the audience. I, I was particularly interested, Albert, in your comment about scandal and how to get away with murder and Grey's Anatomy, because, of course, they're the most interactive shows on your network. Um, they're on the Twitter TV ratings in the top ten, and, and there is a high level of interactivity already. I'm just sort of curious about how you define that now going forward and where that kind of relationship, that very intense stuff that Shonda Rhimes is so yeah. smartly cultivated for all three of her shows, yeah. where that goes down, down the road. Yeah, let me, let me be clear about the definition on interactivity, right? So the, the model, when, when Second Screen came around, the assumption of the model was while you're watching a show, um, viewers wanted to get additional content. 
So in the in the in the tests that we did when we ran it with Gray's Anatomy, it was you know what what disease does this patient have as they're rolling into the ER? I mean these were things that were coming at them uh, coming at people during the show, and I, I think um, that is what I mean by synchronous. Um, the the activity on Twitter that's happening, I mean that is amazing. And what I what I look at that is it's not interactive to the content; it's react it's audience reaction. People are Shonda writes incredible stories that get audiences to react. And I think you know, the product of that reaction is just being sort of felt through social media. But it's very different to say that um, th and that's interactive in the sense that we are capturing audience reaction as opposed to the old model, which is you know, like Beamly and um, Get Glue and a bunch of things, which is throwing trivia polls, right? There was a lot of this content that was being created. And while that was interesting, it just, it wasn't compelling enough to, for people to, for it to be sustainable or even scalable for us. Do you think she'll be able to take that audience and at the, you know, at the end of, you know, her contract with you know, ABC, be able to kind of, um, you know, take a, a lesson out of, you know, um, uh, you know, Freddie Wong's book uh, and basically um, crowdsource, crowdfund, sorry, um, a series that she, you know, predominantly owns and then get Sam's company to deliver an application that allows her to, you know, hyper-monetize her, hyper-monetize her fans. Do you think that's... Um, I would never say that's not possible. I mean, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. If you look at how, you know, how all these ecosystems are developing, I mean, that's kind of the interesting promise of what the future might look like. It'd be really interesting to see those kind of like, you know, high-end television producers, showrunners, and filmmakers kind of actually move the other, you know, move the other direction. I mean, that that could really accelerate and fundamentally kind of change the nature of um, content content consumption, creation, distribution. But along those lines, it'd be interesting to hear from the three of you of what what trends do you feel like are being overlooked. I mean, we've talked about a couple that might be hyper looked at, but what are the ones that that, that we're missing that you're seeing from your vantage point? Actually, uh, I think there's not, actually some of the things that these gentlemen are doing actually right now, I think in general, maybe maybe the VC community is looking at, more, at, at it more closely, but I, I, there isn't much, at least on the traditional side, a focus on what the impact of mobile is for, for the media industry. Um, I mean, right now mobile is just an extension of what we do, but sort of the native, you know, what's the, what's the experience that's native to mobile that is transformative and different? around the entertainment experience on a mobile screen. Because right now, it's just taking what we do and putting it on a screen. I, I, I think we're overlooking and, and saying, what, what happens when the entire population has these smartphones and they're all connected and they all can serve video and there's all this interactivity and they're all geo-targeted and they're all, I mean, there's kind of an interesting thing of, well, what can you do in that ecosystem that has never been done before? And I, I mean, you guys are probably tackling that. Um, I don't see a whole lot of it in sort of general general conversation. So things that um, are overlooked, um, my sense is two things that might be overlooked um, in the VC community and actually, one thing that's overlooked in the VC community is the power of advertisers in the creation of content, and the relationship between a brand and the creation of content. So I think um, that's going to go through a pretty big change over the course of the next uh, few years. And you, if, you, if one of the names that you didn't have up on the, the screen there is Vice, you mm -hmm. know, which is doing mm -hmm. such a phenomenal job of, you know, taking basically, you know, brand partners and finding really intelligent ways to uh, produce content with, you know, uh, with their support. Uh, without compromising their um, their voice, and so I can imagine there being a lot more of that stuff um, happening. Uh, one of the things I don't think is necessarily well understood by the entertainment community here in Los Angeles is, um, you know, how Snapchat stories, uh, you know, are, are, are working, especially around live events, kind of geofenced um, events. You know, the fact that you can literally um, go to a college stadium, you know, and watch kind of like a college game sourced from mo lots of different you know, angles or a concert. I mean, that is, you know, the, the idea that you could sort of in real time participate in an event that was crowdsourced from, you know, uh, you know, 50, 100, 1,000, 10,000 people in a, uh, in a stadium is pretty interesting and exciting, I think. 
I, I think it's similar to Albert's point, but you have three billion people online right now, and you have a lot of platforms vying for those eyeballs. But what about the four billion that are about to come online? And when they do, they're not going to come online first from a desktop or a laptop. It's going to be in their hand. And what does that phone look like as the remote control for your life? And what type of new formats and how do you layer this interactivity that has not worked in the TV medium with second screen, um, but when that's the initial touch point for this new brand of, uh, or new generation of online consumers, what does that look like? And, and how does content change, how does technology change in order to, to fit that, to, uh, meet that demand and that hunger for more content, more access, a closer relationship between the fan and the creator. Pushing them back. Curious if you guys have any views on what are the ad units that, that will have some staying power, will be here as these mediums evolve. You talked about pre-roll being a hangover from another, another era. Um, just curious about your thoughts on that. My thoughts tend to be informed by the games um, business. So, um, you know, if you kind of think about different types of monetization, yeah, you can, you know, you can have um, advertising, um, you know, traditional display advertising, pre-roll advertising. Um, you can sort of then move up the, the food chain and start thinking about how do you create um, native uh, content that is, um, that is, an, is in, of, in and of itself um, a, you know, a, an ad unit, if you like, or a unit that can be, uh, that can be monetized. You can think of um, uh, you know, pay, uh, SVOD, um, uh, paywall, freemium, um, and all of those things are fairly traditional. I think what sits on top of that that kind of gets you to the next level is um, you know, engagement-based monetization, things that take um, very focused audiences of people and find ways to monetize that, that audience really disproportionately. Um, and at the end of the day, that is absolutely a function of um, the content. I think the definition of the content, um, of what the content is, is, ch is changing. You know, the content in YouTube is not just the video. The content in YouTube is the video as it's been produced by the creator in partnership with their, their audience. That whole thing is kind of, you know, an ecosystem. And that's actually very similar to the way that kind of customers in games participate. You know, they're highly engaged at the very, very center of this sort of content experience. And once you find those, those, um, those veins of, uh, of, of people that or those those highly focused, highly engaged audiences, um, you can really sort of move to the next level of, of, of monetization. I think it's, I think to answer that question is content comes first. So if you're asking, the content has to be good to attract the advertiser, and then that sort of sets them in motion a pro, what I call a process. So it's, and then and once the content go, you know, is out there, it's a constant sort of, I'm not gonna say negotiation, but sort of massaging of sort of how does the, how does the ad unit and how do we work with the advertiser to maximize that? Now, I mean, I think with the rapid pace of digital and all these different formats, I think we have been sort of just porting a model from one to the next, not really massaging it. Um, I think, you know, when you go into these meetings with uh, advertisers, there's always an intent to figure out how to do it differently. Um, but I will say that there is a mentality of uh, constantly moving back and, and settling in for what is, what is familiar. And, um, we've we've gone at it where we've looked at the monetization driving the content, and it never ever turns out well. Like, oh, what's the business model? Let's figure out how to create content against that. Um, what you've seen in in television is an evolution, right? You create a great show, and over the years, as the costs of programming have gone up, and you know you want to you know sort of monetize it through advertising, you've sort of massaged it again. You created more ad units, you created more ad breaks, and put more ads in it, and and that sort of is an evolutionary process. But it always starts out with good content because if you don't have that. It's very hard to get anyone to want to you know, pay for anything. Great. Well, thank you all uh, on the panel uh, for participating. And now for the good part. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was great. New media platforms of tomorrow or let's meet in Modesto. <laughs> TV used to be a habit, but now it's a snack. YouTube is not cats on skateboards anymore. It is crack. <laughs> Video Game High School by Wong may be the new Lost. All the great entertainment at a fraction the cost. Short form entertainment is a new skill and the incumbents are struggling. The innovator's dilemma shows up even in entertainment and is equally puzzling. At what points, you ask, do new forms change the process of creation? 
when you don't write around commercials anymore and pre-roll monetization. Mobile is half the audience. And for us to be doing it to unlock new revenue, we need a brand new ad unit. Internet video is raw and rough at times, but a billion, a billion viewers don't mind it. There is amazing content on YouTube. Thank fuck no one can find it. <laughs> Fans and millennials don't migrate easily. It's a sign of the times. And it sucks to trade television dollars for digital dimes. In freemium games, 10x monetization can be want-based, and payers in games like it better after you give them a taste. There's huge M&A in creator video once you can get the big scale. Content cost is pretty cheap when you can promote the long tail. Sam hopes that VCs keep pumping money into the situation. And Sam, it surely buys cool black sports coats. Does it increase innovation? <laughs> you say that Google and Kleiner are impressed by a handheld elephant who will obviously be the new artwork on the US $500 million bill. And if Neil wants to watch the Giants win the World Series closer than a luxury box, it's going to have to tune into Magic Leap, not ABC Sports or Fox. In LA, storytelling is the center of conversation, while 300 miles north, it's about tech and company creation. If there's going to be a partnership, maybe it's best, though, for Hollywood to meet Sillywood in downtown Modesto. <laughs>